class. Um, this is Dr. Joel Gooden. I'll be covering mood disorders and suicide. Um, mood disorders involve severe alterations in mood for long periods of time. The disturbances of mood are intense and persistent, enough to be clearly maladaptive and often lead to serious problems in relationships and work performance. Mania um, is basically intense and unrealistic feelings, intense and unrealistic feelings of excitement and euphoria, not necessarily joy. Whereas depression involves feelings of extraordinary sadness and dejection. These two moods are involved in most mood disorders. Mania and depression are somewhat opposite unless it's a mixed episode where wherein they occur within the same time period. Unipolar depressive disorder um, has depressive episodes only. Okay, whereas bipolar disorders um, involve a person experiencing both manic and depressive episodes. Uh, we normally note when we talk about these the severity and the duration of each. So here, th this is on here for you. Um, you can pause it and take a look. Um, but uh, major depressive episode is the most common mood um, issue. Um, here you see the criteria. Um, and one thing I will note for you, we're going to get into it here in a minute, but of course, five of the following. This is taken from the DSM-5. Um, so five out of the nine um, for at least a two-week period. Depressed mood most of the day. Markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or most activities. Significant weight loss or gain. Insomnia or hypersomnia. Psychomotor agitation or retardation. Fatigue or loss of energy. And this... Uh, I've, I've said wrong before, but um, this is slowing down. Agitation doesn't necessarily mean speeding up, but one thing to note about it is it's it's bothered. It may not be slowed down. You might have a, a twitch or, or something like that. Um, might have uh, shaky, shaky hands or something like that. Fatigue or loss of energy is very common. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt, very common. Diminished ability to think or concentrate um, or make decisions, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Um, and, and here we see some of the, the other major things. It must cause clinically significant distress or impairment, uh, not attributed to something else like a substance. Um, and one thing I, I did want to note here. Um, responses to a significant loss like bereavement, um, so a death, um, we, we'll get back to that, um, how, how that may resemble a depressive episode, but we're, we're not going to label it a depressive episode. Um, so a manic episode is, um, involves markedly elevated, euphoric, or expansive mood often interrupted by occasional outbursts of intense irritability or even violence, particularly when others refuse to go along with the manic person's wishes and schemes. Um, here, here are the criteria uh, from the DSM-5. Uh, a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated expanse for irritable mood and abnormally and persistently increased goal-directed activity or energy. Um, sometimes the goals are unclear, but um, they, they normally focus on something and go about it very quickly and with much fervor. Uh, during the period, um, three of the following symptoms, three of these seven, four if the mood is only irritable. So inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, um, 
feels rested after only three hours of sleep. More talkative than usual, or pressure to keep talking, feels they can't keep their mouth shut. Flight of ideas or subjective, uh, subjective experience that thoughts are racing. Uh, distractibility um, may act sort of uh, hyperactive, ADHD. Increase in goal-directed activity, um, either socially, at work, what it, sexually, whatever they're doing, they're, they're probably going to do a lot of it. Um, and inhibition um, seems to be greatly decreased during this time. Excessive involvement in activities that have, this is the inhibition, high potential for pain, painful consequences. Unrestrained buying sprees, sexual indiscretion, foolish business investments, things like that. Um, causes marked impairment again and not attributed to substances, etc. Um, so um, this, this can be very damaging. Um, um, and, and maybe uh, much quicker than, than depression, um, the damage it can do. Apart from suicide, of course, with depression, this will cause more damage to the individual and, and those around them, perhaps. Uh, so a hypomanic episode, you see, um, starts here and ends here. Um, hypomanic episode uh, involves the same symptoms with less social impairment, less social impairment than uh, what is caused by a manic episode and less uh, impairment of occupational functioning. And usually there's no hospitalization needed. Um, so um, here we have a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated expansive or irritable mood during the period um, three uh, of the following. And here we have seven again. But here we have something, um, some some different criteria that you need to pay attention to. The episode is associated with an unequivocal change in functioning that is uncharacteristic of the individual. Um, so it's not their normal mood. We're making sure of that they're not just happy all the time and very, you know, gregarious, talkative, things like that, normally. So it's not their normal mood. It's observable by others not severe enough to cause marked impairment okay in social or occupational functioning so they can still get by they they can still have a normal lifestyle um, maybe not normal enough to, to be undiagnosed but um, uh, all the same okay uh, mild depression that's not this isn't a criterion yeah, um, it, it's people experience depression, a depressed state normally, and it's it's normally protective. Um, it's normal for a short period of time. It may protect from futile pursuits, pursuits such as resistance to whatever um, you know. If, for instance, the uh, Notre Dame Irish whether you like them or not, lose to Florida State on a horrible call. You know, you might be depressed. Um, normally, you might want to go punch some fee people in the face, but instead, since you're depressed, you just fall asleep and cry a little bit. You know, I'm just saying, that's a for instance. Um, not that I did that. Um, okay, so normal, protective, so you don't uh, expend more energy resisting when there's no point. Um, but again, this is no official criteria. Um, something that's important to note is that, um, especially in the DSM-5, we do more and more to, to do this. Um, to distinguish between grieving over the loss of a loved one and depression. Depression peaks after a loss, uh, loss of a loved one during the months two through six. And here we have um, some talk about um, how it's going to be similar. Um, 
but it's going to be less specific, basically. Uh, I'll let you read this on your own time, but you need to know that um, a major depressive episode is different from bereavement because it's not going to be about a specific loss. Um, let's see. The MDE is more persistent and not tied to specific thoughts or preoccupations. Okay, that's probably the, the biggest thing I want you to know about that. Um, Bowlby talked about four stages of grief. Um, his is less well known. Numbing, disbelief, yearning, and searching. Um, so numbing normally lasts about a week. Yearning and searching involves restlessness, insomnia, preoccupation, anger with the deceased. Uh, it's lasts from, for, from weeks to months. Um, this disorganization and despair um, is sort of an acceptance phase. It uh, accepts the loss as permanent and tries to establish a new identity. Um, so if you're uh, a female and your husband dies, um, you have to establish your new identity as a widow. Um, and you may meet the major depressive um, disorder criteria during that time, uh, but it should be noticed that um, it's, it's grieving unless it lasts more than uh, six months. Um, after that, third stage is reorganization, uh, where one rebuilds their lives. The sadness tends to dissipate and there's a new zeal for life eventually. Some people get stuck at a stage, um, and I'm sorry, major depressive uh, disorder is not diagnosed until two months later, um, I believe. You may want to double check that. But, um, postpartum blues um, on that last stage um, uh, involve uh, there's emotional ability. Crying is very easy for these people. Irritability often liberally intermixed with happy feelings. Um, so very difficult postpartum, of course, is after you've had a baby. Um, the feelings of sadness mixed with joy, but um, many experience a lot of a lot of extra sadness. Um, and uh, that that can involve that yeah that can involve some major issues um, with the with the new mother um, depression often results from the life event and formation of new identity but is not more likely to occur due to pregnancy than in non-pregnant women so um, and we're also going to look at uh, Kubler-Ross um, this is a better known uh, stages of grieving more more famous. Uh, Kubler-Ross is female, by the way. Um, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, very, uh, very good uh, explanation, and of course it came from her book on death and dying. Um, so, dysthymic disorder um, involves a mild to moderate intensity but it is chronic, lasts at least two years. Um, uh, intermittent normal moods and doesn't happen in, uh, during a major depressive uh, disorder. Um, the intermittent, intermittent normal moods do not occur during major depressive disorder. And I did not post the criteria here. Um, We've got the main ideas here. It's it's uh, it's a milder depression, just lasts a long time. Okay. Uh, major depressive disorder has more symptoms, of course, and is more persistent. It's often comorbid with anxiety, um, and we're gonna differentiate between single and recurrent. Um, of course, you have a single bout of depression, or a, uh, then, and good for you. Um, 
recurrent is the opposite. That means you have more than one. Um, the average duration of an untreated episode is six to nine months. Um, greater than two years uh, of a major depressive episode um, or disorder is called chronic major depressive disorder. Remission is uh, two months of no symptoms, but if a relapse happens, um, that's a return of symptoms within a fairly short period of time that reflects the underlying episode has not yet run its course. And that'll occur before these two months of no symptoms normally. Um, onset is normally in late adolescence, and there's a lower prevalence after the age of 60. Um, so you got something to look forward to. Um, notice that when we're diagnosing, when we're looking at the DSM criteria, there are often specifiers, which is additional patterns or, or features. Um, that are important to know when making a diagnosis because these patterns have implications for understanding the course of the disorder and or its most effective treatment. So there's uh, these examples for instance uh, major depress depressive episode with melancholic features um, that could be uh, you know a person that shows no pleasure and might have uh, childhood trauma um, Severe major depressive episode with psychotic features. This is often characterized by loss of contact with reality and delusions. Notice psychotic features. Um, delusions being false beliefs or even hallucinations, which are false sensory perceptions. Um, delusions and hallucinations are, are mood congruent. Uh, They're appropriate to depression. Um, negative in tone, uh, hallucinations, uh, inadequacy, guilt, deserving of punishment, death, and disease. Uh, guilt and worthlessness are also very common. Uh, you often take an antidepressant with an antipsychotic. Um, if it's major depressive episode with atypical features, um, that's a pattern of symptoms characterized by mood reactivity. Uh, mood brightens in response to potential positive events. Um, usually happens with females. Also is linked to bipolar disorder with hypomanic episodes. Um, and then we have recurrent major depressive episode with a seasonal pattern. And we're going to get into this on the next slide. It's basically seasonal affective disorder. Um, two episodes of depression in two years um, is, is one of the criteria. Um, it has to happen the same time every year, begin the same time, and remit or end um, the same time every year. So um, it's almost always the fall, uh, the fall when things start getting colder and darker. Um, um, Remission uh, is all right. Um, seasonal affective disorder is worse in northern latitudes and also in younger people. Um, depression with dysthymia is called double depression. Um, so, moderately depressed on a chronic basis, which is dysthymia, but under, undergo increased problems from time to time, meeting major depressive episode criteria. Um, this is common among dysthymics. It causes um, is two to three times higher among blood relatives. 31 to 42 percent of depression is due to genetics. Um, an adoption study has showed uh, relatives are seven times have a seven times greater chance of double depression. There's no specific gene yet known, although serotonin transporter gene. Um, as it's called, is a gene involved in the transmission and reuptake of serotonin. It increases susceptibility to depression after stressful life events. Um, so we get into talk, of, I won't go into this a lot, but SS alleles and LL alleles, SS alleles with childhood maltreatment um, are twice as likely than LL alleles.
Okay, so if you're interested in genetics, you may want to look at further into the alleles. Um, so here we have the monomene theory of depression, um, and basically we're talking about neurotransmitters. Um, Depression is sometimes due to an absolute or relative depletion of norepinephrine or serotonin. It can be one or both, actually, at important receptor sites in the brain. Um, and this theory, uh, the way it's worded is actually, there's insufficient evidence for it the way it's worded. Um, basically, dopamine dysfunction causes some you know, some of the other viewpoints are that dopamine dysfunction causes some depression, um, altered neurotransmitter activity in several systems is clearly associated with major depression. And then we also think that um, there's something going on with feedback loops um, in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or HPA axis. Um, and here you see that. Um, so we're in the cortisol, the adaptive, which is adaptive during emergencies. It remains at high levels, destructive levels even. Um, it can cause hypertension, for instance. Um, cortisol is often resulting from stress or threat. It's normally suppressed by dexamethasone. Um, but early childhood experiences may also influence HPA reactivity. HPA, again, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis here, you see. Um, and these early childhood experiences that uh, affect the HPA reactivity uh, may have long-term consequences. Um, brain function, the lower Lower brain activity in specific areas, such as the left prefrontal cortex and higher in right prefrontal cortex, uh, where anxiety is known to um, have a role, um, may be also significant issues. There's a lower volume of orbital prefrontal cortex, um, in other words, lower size, uh, hippocampal atrophy. Um, associated with long-term depression, atrophy being a shrinking, um, low activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, um, and the amygdala, amygdala, which is our fear center, has elevated activity. Okay, sleep and disorder, just want to touch on this quickly. Um, that's a picture of me sleeping. Uh, abnormal patterns um, of sleep may result in too much REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep as it's known. Uh, not enough, um, when there's too much REM sleep, you have not enough deep sleep. And this can result in a vulnerability. Um, so look, think back about your stress diathesis model. Um, this is a vulnerability. Other, other things to think about are circadian rhythms being disrupted, and that can be um, from abnormal patterns, or it can be just a cause of life. Um, getting in the way, having to work night shifts um, is known to be uh, bad for our mental health. Um, that being said, I am making this video at 4.40 in the morning. Um, light, um, ha light is also an issue. Seasonal affective disorder um, or SAD um, um, lets us know a little bit about how that works. I just mentioned it. a lack of light causes depression. Um, can be treated with artificial light, such as a sun lamp, or even relocation. You can move to Hawaii. Um, don't go to Florida. I don't suggest it. Their referees are bad down there. Oregon and Seattle are known for depression and suicide. Why? Because it's rainy and dark and makes you want to hurt yourself, I guess. Um, but I'd, you know, I'd love to live there. Great music, right? You know, great people, good culture, nice art, you know, all that. But um, better to stay alive, right? Stress issues, stressful life events cause um, 
biochemical and hormonal balance changes and changes to biological rhythms it may influence depression a life event um, can often precipitate a depressive episode events that include humiliation are especially potent caregiving associated with depression sorry caregiving is associated with depression and general anxiety disorder independent versus dependent stress um, so or life events sorry independent are naturally occurring life events whereas dependent are influenced by personality life events play a role in predicting depression um, so here we look into some some more dependent cognitive patterns um, is a pessimistic outlook um, associated with depression um, it can be the antecedent or the result or, or both um, it may alter perception of how stressful a life event actually is um, and often among depressed individuals you see um, a very negative perception of life any life event um, slightly negative um, may may seem disastrous to a depressed individual um, Depression due to life event um, involves more severe symptoms. Uh, first onset is 70%. Uh, first onset of a depression uh, episode is 70% of the time due to a life event. Recurrent episode, uh, in other words, your second or third or fourth episode of depression, 40% of the time is due to a life event. Chronic stress is one or more forms of stress for at least two months associated with depression. One or more forms of stress for at least two months associated with depression. Um, and one thing to note here is not all stressors are perceived equally. That's just something to just keep in mind. Um, here we're getting more into personality issues. Neuroticism is the primary personality variable that increases vulnerability for depression and anxiety. Neuroticism refers to a stable and heritable, in other words, genetic personality trait that involves a temperamental sensitivity to negative stimuli. You're prone to sadness, anxiety, guilt, and even hostility. So it's predictive of stressful life events. I mean, you put that sort of and not to be new agey on you, but you put that sort of negative energy into the world, um, you act like that towards the world, you're likely to have negative life events. You're likely to lose your job or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your dog's going to run away. Um, that may not happen because dogs are loyal, but you get the idea. Um, so we have what's called a cognitive diathesis, um, which is a diathesis means vulnerability. Cognitive focus on particular negative patterns of thinking, especially when faced with stressful life events. And, and this gets into negative attributions. Why did that happen to me? It's because um, you hate me. It's because I'm a failure. It's because of these things. Um, and, and just attribution means reasoning. Or sort of like if you were to point at something and say, that is to blame for this. Uh, what's to blame for you getting laid off of a job? Well, one person might say, well, it's a tough economy. Um, another person might say, a boss is out to get me. They don't like me because I'm white or whatever color you are. Um, making negative attributions. Um, early adversity, abuse, neglect, low socioeconomic status influences vulnerability to depression. And there's this idea of stress inoculation. Um, and that, that early adversity could serve as, it may or may not, um, but it works like a flu shot. Um, so it, it can occur buffering rather than increasing vulnerability and actually bolstering a person against uh, possible depression. Next slide is Freud, psychodynamic theory. Here we see Freud with his cigar, and Freud did say sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. 
Clinton would highly disagree. Um, psychodynamic theory. Freud said that when a loved one dies, we regress to our oral stage of development in his psychosexual stages of development. We cannot distinguish ourselves from others during the oral stage. And we interject or incorporate the lost person, the deceased, we incorporate them actually into ourselves. And then feeling all the same feelings toward ourself as we do towards the person we've lost. Okay? It may sound a little strange to you, but one thing you need to know about Freud, one of the first people to start talking about this stuff, a genius, maybe a little crazy, but really had some interesting ideas and got, got the ball rolling. But one phrase that sticks with all of us today, one phrase that I commonly say is anger, I'm sorry, depression is often referred to as anger turned inward. Okay, anger turned inward. So, you can see how his statement of incorporating the lost individual into yourself, maybe to try to hang on to them, but still being angry at them, could cause some conflict. I, I'll say it that way. That's a moderating his his view of it a little bit, but um, anger turn inward is a really good way to think about depression. Um, normally depressed individuals are very hard on themselves, if not hateful towards themselves. Um, Freud said depression may result from imagined or symbolic losses. So a symbolic loss might be a breakup or, or being fired from a job um, or a divorce, of course. Um, Freud um, said that insufficient family or parenting, uh, a mother not being around, um, unfulfilled nurturance and need for love could lead to a vulnerability for depression. Later researchers also emphasized the mother-infant relationship in establishing depression vulnerability. Um, in, among other ways, low self-esteem. Okay, next we have Beck. Um, and Beck focused more on our thoughts, our cognitions. Um, Beck's cognitive theory says that cognitive symptoms of depression precede and cause the affective or mood symptoms. Dysfunctional beliefs, um, depressinogenic schemas, as they're called, depresso Depressogenic, sorry. Um, rigid, extreme, counterproductive. If no one loves me, life is worthless, they might say. Okay, extremely rigid, extremely negative, and extremely counterproductive. These cognitive systems may lie dormant for years after childhood rearing, but arise during a stressful life event. And they fuel current thinking pattern of negative automatic thoughts, thoughts that often occur just below the surface of our awareness and involve unpleasant pessimistic predictions. These pessimistic predictions have three themes called the cognitive triad. Um, it's, it's similar to a uh, street gang. Um, negative self thoughts negative thoughts about experiences and environment and negative thoughts about the future and they're maintained by cognitive biases or errors Dichotom um, dichotomous thinking all or none reasoning extreme thinking that if I can't get 100% right there's no point in doing it um, and then there's this idea called selective abstraction a tendency to focus on one negative detail of a situation while ignoring all the other elements some of which are probably positive selective abstraction the word abstract like an abstract painting um, is the root word here selective abstraction and then there's arbitrary inference okay these are all under cognitive biases and errors Arbitrary inference is jumping to a conclusion based on minimal or no evidence. 
this theory resulted in cognitive therapy, which is still used today and has been largely combined with, cognitive, with behavioral therapy in cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. The theory of helplessness, this has had a few different stages of progression. Um, so the first, you know, it's been reformulated is what I'm trying to say. Learned helplessness um, eventually, uh, originally by Seligman, Martin Seligman. Um, after failures, he said, we eventually react passively and helplessly. And an animal study he did um, showed that um, after enough failures, we, we don't even try anymore. When humans find that they have no control over aversive events, negative events, they may learn that they are helpless, which makes them unmotivated to try to respond in the future. Instead, they exhibit passivity and depressive symptoms, slow to learn responses that are effective after that time, especially. Um, and Seligman noticed, actually, in his animals, he noticed they looked depressed. And that's sort of how this got started. Of course, then Abramson, um, join, Abramson and Teasdale joined Seligman, reformulated the helplessness theory, and said the kinds of attributions, those blames, the reasonings uh, people make about uncontrollable negative events influence depression likelihood or vulnerability. Attributions are either internal, external, global or specific, and stable or unstable. Which attribution choice, choices would a depressed person make? What is an example? Internal, stable, global. If your boy tra boyfriend treats you badly, it's because I'm ugly and boring. And that leads to depression versus it's because he's in a bad mood today after failing his exam and he's taking it out on me. Which would be external, could still be stable. Um, but you know, one one main thing here is they're blaming their self rather than the other person. Um, automatically blaming themselves. It could be their fault, but a lot of depressed individuals, especially in cognitive theory, um, we think of, you know we notice that they have automatic thoughts of self-blame and guilt. Um, a pessimistic attribution style is a vulnerability for depression when faced with uncontrollable and negative life events. It develops to some extent through social learning or parents and society. You might want to think about how your own parents affected your ways of thinking. Of course, there was a later revision of the theory, helplessness theory, which called it hopelessness theory. Um, Having a pessimistic attribution style in conjunction with one or more negative life events was not sufficient to produce depression unless one first experienced a state of hopelessness. So there's this hopelessness expectancy as well. The perception that one had no control over what was going to happen, an absolute certainty that an important bad outcome would occur or a highly desired good outcome would not occur. At this point, food for thought, why are women twice as likely to have unipolar depression? We're going to look at some other factors apart from gender. Um, Interpersonal problems and social skill deficits may influence depression and be influenced by it. Um, lack of social support is a key issue in depression. Depressed people are not fun to be around. You hear the word, you know, the words Debbie Downer, Eeyore. Um, marital discord is also associated with depression. Specifically, criticism. Oh, specific criticism often triggers depression. Um, and it's not just marital discord, but what would a living with a depressed parent be like? Some of you may know. And what would be the result of living with a depressed uh, parent? 
bipolar disorders um, are distinguished from unipolar disorders by the presence of manic or hypomanic episodes, which are nearly always preceded or followed by periods of depression. Manic episodes um, involve markedly elevated, euphoric, and expansive mood, often interrupted by occasional outbursts of intense irritability or violence, particularly when others refuse to go along with the manic person's wishes and schemes. Okay. Cyclothymic disorder. Um, less severe mood swings um, is sort of what we're going to get into. It's a less serious version of full-blown bipolar disorder characterized by a cyclical or a cycle of new changes that are less severe than mood swings of, of bipolar disorder, less extreme symptoms and no psychotic features. That's important to note. Um, no delusions. Um, you can of course read the criteria here. Um, depressive state is akin to dysthymia but uh, doesn't last as long, whereas hypomanic phase is the opposite of dysthymia. Okay, now we're going to get into bipolar 1 versus bipolar 2. Um, now might be a great time for you to pause for a second, take a break, get a drink, whatever you like to do. Um, if you haven't already, you should be doing that like every 15 minutes. Um, take a break. You don't want to listen to me for that long. Uh, bipolar 1 disorder is distinguished from major depressive disorder by at least one manic episode or mixed episode. A mixed episode is characterized by symptoms of both full-blown manic and major depressive episodes for at least one week, whether the symptoms are intermixed or alternate rapidly every few days. And there is no current unipolar you know, type of manic disorder. It's just something to keep in mind. Bipolar 2 disorder, um, by the way, we're going to stay on this slide for a bit. Bipolar 2 disorder with a seasonal pattern can occur. Again, that would be a specifier. Um, manic and hypomanic episodes tend to be shorter than depressive episodes by one third. Depressive episodes in bipolar disorder, as opposed to unipolar depression, exhibit greater mood lability, more psychotic features, more psychomotor retardation, and more substance abuse. Less anxiety, agitation, insomnia, physical complaints, and weight loss. Bipolar um, major depressive episodes are more severe than unipolar major depressive episodes. Whereas bipolar individuals may be misdiagnosed with unipolar depression, possibly due to predating manic episodes, it should be noted that some unipolar depression treatments may actually lead to or precipitate manic episodes. Let me say that again. Some treatments for unipolar depression may actually cause manic episodes. Okay. Rapid cycling. When those with bipolar disorder experience four or more episodes each year, either manic or depress depressive. Rapid cycling is temporary, um, about two years for, uh, that's among half of the people that get it. So about half the people, it lasts only about two years or less. Rapid cycling is more common in women um, and leads to, is known by earlier onset in life and also known for having, causing more suicide attempts. Um, when you think about suicide attempts, it's not just sadness, but think about the difficulty of the lifestyle you would have to lead. lead. Um, so when life is horrible, if you're rapid cycling, uh, would be very, um, you, you would have very little peace ever. And even when depressed or manic, you, you might be able to get used to that, but switching back and forth, I can only imagine how difficult that would be. 
Um, thankfully, I've never experienced rapid cycling. Um, bipolar disorder is normally lifelong. Uh, full recovery is rare. Now looking at some causes. Um, there's a great genetic predisposition more than any other disorder, 80 to 90 percent. Polygenic, which means multiple genetic, um, but multiple gene cul culprits have yet to be specified. So we believe it's polygenic, but we haven't, you know, specified all the genes that we think are playing a role or how they're doing it together. Um, there is a norepinephrine increase in, in dopamine activity, uh, dopaminergic activity in several brain areas um, associated with manic symptoms of hyperactivity, grandiosity, and euphoria. Cocaine, cocaine and amphetamines are known to stimulate dopamine um, and they also produce manic-like behavior. Cortisol levels, um, look at the HPA axis for this, they are elevated during depressive episodes only. Okay, only during depressive episodes. Also similar to unipolar, um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or um, DST abnormalities occur but decline during manic episodes. Blood flow to prefrontal cortex is reduced during depression but increased during mania. Like unipolar, there are deficits of activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex associated with neuropsychological deficits of bipolar disorder. Um, so what would that be? Problem solving, planning, working memory, shifting of attentional sets, sustained attention on cognitive tasks. Okay, um, this is a really dense slide. You may want to go back, slow it down, something like that. Um, basically we're just talking about some of the causes, potential causes. Um, so blood flow issues, um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex issues, uh, cortisol levels, these are all things I've talked about. I don't expect you to memorize all of them. Um, subcortical structures um, are also an issue here. The basal ganglia and the amygdala are enlarged in bipolar disorder but reduced um, in size in unipolar depression. There's also a size difference in uh, hippocampal volume, um, decreased um, in unipolar depression, but that decrease in volume is not found in bipolar depression. Compared to unipolar, um, there's more activation in subcortical brain regions involved in emotional processing, the thalamus and the amygdala. Circadian rhythm disruption even when bipolar symptoms have remitted. So insomnia is common during mania. Hypersomnia or too much sleep is common during depressive episodes. Stressful life events are equally important and influential in bipolar depressive episodes as, as much as unipolar and they may pre precipitate the, the manic episodes. They may activate the underlying vulnerability. Negative events triple recovery time from manic, depressive, or mixed episodes. So if you're in one of those episodes, um, if it's caused by a negative event or if negative events happen while you're in one, it may triple the time that it lasts. Um, since biological rhythms are emphasized in bipolar disorder, the destabilizing effect of stressful life events on biological rhythms is somewhat explanatory um, in, in telling us well, when you're going along a normal path, slow and steady, you know, whatever. And so when a stressful life event comes along, uh, it has a dis destabilizing effect on our biological rhythms, um, which, you know, may play a major role in depression. Okay. So how to treat? Um, wait, before I get there, bipolar uh, is unrelated to race, 
or socioeconomic status. Uh, artistic individuals are overrepresented with mood disorders. Um, creativity and pro productivity periods often co-vary with mania, hypomania, and depressive phases. Think of Emily Dickinson. Um, so now to treatment. Lithium is used as a mood stabilizer in that it has anti-manic and antidepressant effects. Antidepressants are not used since they often precipitate manic episodes or rapid cycling. So when we have bipolar, we normally stay away from antidepressants and use a mood stabilizer, um, something like lithium. Um, Lithium is used, but you have to watch blood levels um, because it can be toxic if it builds up too much. Um, so one research study, um, one study um, of patients discontinuing medication um, had a risk of having a new episode uh, 28 times higher per month when not on medication. Uh, lithium side effects are lethargy, cognitive slowing, weight gain, decreased motor coordination, gastrointestinal difficulties, long-term use sometimes associated with kidney malfunction or permanent kidney damage. That's why we watch the blood levels. Um, and just to side note here, this is, uh, well, the disorder itself is sometimes only half of the horrible part. Fixing the disorder and going through all these side effects can be almost as horrible and sometimes why people quit taking their medication. Um, even one of these side effects, gastrointestinal difficulties does not sound as good as sound. As, it does, sounds better than it is. We're talking about diarrhea there, folks. Upset stomach all the time. Things like that are, are quite possible. And it may just you may just rather not have diarrhea and rather have bipolar. Um, I'm not trying to be crude here. I'm just saying sometimes it's very difficult to live with these side effects of the medicines. Um, remember, psychology is a very young science, and we still are are not experts with the medicines. Still, um, well, we're always working on decreasing those side effects. Um, but um, side effects are different for everybody um, and and when we get into brain chemistry that's basically what we're doing uh, it can be very difficult to to find the right cocktail of medicines so relapse is common people miss the euphoria and abundance of energy um, in addition to just hating the any side effects um, Anticonvulsants are also used when lithium fails. When psychosis is also occurring, when it's comorbid, um, antipsychotic medications are used as well. If it's unipolar only, my, we're going to use MAOI inhibitors, or MAO inhibitors, sorry. Uh, tricyclics, SSRIs, might use ECT or TMS. Um, so ECT electroconvulsive therapy, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and might, might even use bright light therapy. We're not going to use all of them. We're going to start with um, the, the one that's least dangerous and least invasive into your life. And ECT, TMS are going to be sort of last resort sort of things. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation is a non-invasive focal stimulation of the brain while patients are awake um, using brief but intense pulsating magnetic fields that induce electrical activity in certain parts of the cortex. It's very it's somewhat similar to ECT which basically reboots the brain and causes a, a very short temporary seizure in the brain. Um, it's basically like flipping your computer on and off um, and hoping that problem will reset itself and, and be fixed, um, so to speak. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is only used with unipolar um, depression. Uh, behavioral activation treatment also used with unipolar depression only. 
There's a focus on getting patients to be active and engaged with their environment in this behavioral activation ther treatment. Sorry. Be engaged with your environment, be active, and with their interpersonal relationships. Um, they, they schedule daily activities. They rate their pleasure and mastery while engaging in them. They explore alternative behaviors to reach their goals. And um, there's some role playing, nothing, you know, unsavory, but role playing to address specific deficits. Uh, increase positive reinforcement for oneself, reduce avoidance and withdrawal, um, basically work on communication, work on positive thought patterns, uh, possible, uh, positive social um, communication and interaction. And then we get to IPT or interpersonal therapy which focuses on current relationship issues, trying to help the person understand and change maladaptive interaction patterns. A lot of us have these um, negative interaction patterns. Even if you're married, you probably still have plenty of issues. Um, even if you're in a relationship, um, we can all always improve. Some of us, uh, I'm not pointing at myself here necessarily, but some of us, um, these inter, you know, if we don't work on our interpersonal uh, relationship issues, if they're really ingrained and really problematic, um, they can cause problems after problems, divorce after divorce, and um, you know, just leaving not only yourself but the other people um, harmed in the process. It's very important that you take time to look into that. And while I'm on the subject, I encourage any of you who are interested in relationships, not just um, you know romantic, but uh, friendships, relationships, uh, parents and children, siblings. You may want to look into um, transactional analysis, and I can, I can of course, uh, lead you to some of that by Eric Byrne. Um, he was an expert and, and very, uh, very genius ideas on, on basically analyzing our transactions. Uh, in other words, our communication, our, how we relate to each other. Um, the majority of manic and depressed patients. Uh, recover from a given episode in less than a year even without formal therapy but there's a stigma that remains so that only 50 percent actually seek treatment and get adequate treatment okay last slide um, I'm gonna end on a sad note here with Robin Williams my captain um, suicide is a major issue in all types of depression um, Suicide is obviously taking one's own life, um, and lately there, there's been some, um, I would say, some sympathy. Um, and I'm, I'm not opposed to sympathy, but even some positive uh, discussion of suicide. Uh, of course, there, there's a law in Oregon that will allow um, physician-assisted um, suicide um, it's just an interesting uh, societal trend at this point in 2014. Um, some some stats for you: um, 50 to 90 percent of suicides occur during a depressive episode or in the recovery phase, sometimes while emerging from the lowest point of depression. This is often why you see suicide related to an antidepressant, because um, when you're fully depressed you have no energy no willpower um, no even volition to take to, to perform the act of suicide but once you get on an antidepressant in the early stages of starting to feel better but while you're still feeling horrible and hating yourself you get just enough energy or momentum to maybe take action on your very very negative and harmful self thoughts okay uh, ninety percent of all suicide attempts or completions were by those with some psychiatric disorder although only fifty percent of those had been diagnosed prior to suicide um, so that means a lot of people not getting the treatment they need ahead of time multiple mental disorders increase risk uh, suicide is the eighth leading cause of death in the u.s. thirty one thousand people per year officially although many go unreported um, 
highest rates of suicide are between 18 and 24 years of age and that's that's a new trend as well in our in our generations um, it was previously the generation that was 25 to 44 years old now suicide is is more popular among 18 to 24 years of age um, women are three times as likely to attempt suicide uh, divorcees or separated individuals are three to four times as likely to attempt suicide. Men, however, are four times more successful with suicide. You, you can't say we're not better at something. Um, unfortunately, it is suicide. Uh, gender difference in completion does not apply to bipolar disorder, however. Completions of suicide are highest in the elderly, however, um, 65 and above years of age, due to multiple factors, physical, emotional um, issues, um, lack of hope, things like that. A mood disorder um, results in a 15% risk of suicide, schizophrenia, 10 to 15% risk of suicide, alcohol dependence, um, averages 3 to 4 percent risk of suicide. Average citizen has a 1.4 percent risk of suicide. Suicide is rare in children but is increasing by 70 percent since 1981. Um, that's from 10 percent to 14 percent. Um, increased risk due to socioeconomic status, parental loss or abuse as well as psychopathology. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in the U.S. among 15 to 19 year olds worldwide trend. High school attempts um, have increased by 8.5 percent of students per year and this is largely with the, the recent trend of cutting, um, cutting behavior, self-mutilation. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death in college students um, and we know that 10 percent contemplate suicide each year. One out of every ten college students contemplate suicide. Um, so some questions to answer are why is suicide increasing among younger individuals? Is it... No, I, I, I'm not even going to get into that but um, in class it's something we can discuss. Do antidepressants increase likelihood of suicide? That's something that they're still investigating. Um, what about celebrity endorsement of suicide? Kurt Cobain um, being somebody that people looked up to and um, adolescents are highly susceptible to suggestion and imitative behavior uh, so they see things on the media. Um, for warning signs and, and what you should do about them look at page 218 in your book um, Suicide is associated with impulsivity, aggression, and pessimism. Uh, some warning signs are, are going to be depression, of course. Uh, people who don't want to do anything anymore. People talking about hurting themselves. People joking about hurting themselves. Um, isolation um, can be a big issue. Giving things away um, can be uh, a warning sign. Um, Suicide is precipitated by events that represent a loss of sense of meaning in life and or hopelessness about the future. Low self-esteem, hopelessness, poor problem-solving skills can also be a reason. Um, is there a genetic predisposition? Yeah, it, it does tend to run in families. Um, this could have to do with reduced serotonin functioning. Okay. Um, this is interesting. Whites are more likely than blacks, um, but equal to Native Americans uh, to um, attempt suicide. The highest rates of suicide are in Hungary, Switzerland, Finland, Austria, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Japan, and China. I don't know what all those have in common, but I do know you know a lot of those are more cold areas. But uh, definitely, I don't think all of them. Of course, I'm not teaching geography, so it's not my strong suit. 
Uh, religious and societal sanctions, of course, we, I just talked about this changing, but there's a lower suicide rate in Catholic and Islamic countries where suicide is considered taboo. It's a automatic ticket to hell um, in many uh, circles, uh, viewpoints. Um, however, there's sort of a social approval of, soci of suicide in, in Japan, um, kamikaze uh, and, and terrorists. Um, men are more likely to attempt um, suicide in India, Poland, and Finland, while women are more likely to complete suicide in China, India, and Papua New Guinea. A sense of involvement in identity when others, with, sorry, with others. So being part of a group um, deters suicide. So I ask you this, could this, a sense of involvement in identity with others deters suicide? Could that explain the higher incidence of suicide in today's youth? being more isolated, feeling less of a group identity. I don't know. Um, is this is this tied to social media is basically what I'm asking. Threatening suicide is often referred to as a cry for help. Alert authorities immediately if they have if a friend of yours or someone you hear about has a suicidal plan or or more than that. Definitely if they have a weapon and the plan. Um, Suicidal ideation, you want to check in with them. How likely is it that you're going to act on this? Normally, if they have a plan, though, you it is your responsibility as a citizen to call the authorities. No matter if this person is going to hate you forever, it's better than them being dead forever. Only about one in four um, suicide completers leave a note. Um, it's just interesting uh, to note. Uh, preventative efforts. Um, treatment of mental disorders. Crisis intervention. Working with high-risk groups. Talking about suicide or asking someone if they are considering suicide does not increase the likelihood of suicide. Let me say that again. Talking about it openly. Talking about suicide. Asking your friend are you thinking about suicide? Somebody's really depressed and I'm like, hey, are you are you having suicidal thoughts? That is not going to make them more likely to commit suicide. It's important to have those discussions and to find out where each other what each other are thinking and to be a true friend and just shows you care. It doesn't mean you're trying to give them an idea, hey, maybe you should do this. I care about each other, take care about each other, even if you don't like the other person. We are a human family. We need to take care of each other. I'll see you at the next slide, next chapter.